Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing my March wrap up. Currently reading a manga series called Cat Plus Gamer. Yeah so I've read volume three and four and yeah it's just cute. It's kind of a bit basic but sometimes you just want to read basic shit. It doesn't have to be like world view altering. It can just be a comforting thing to read on an evening before you go to bed so that you can sleep I don't know. Moving on to profound novels. <laughs> Dawn by Octavia Butler. I have been meaning to read this woman's work for literal years. I've got several of her books on my shelf but I've just been intimidated because everyone said she's fantastic, she's one of the greatest science fiction writers ever and her plot sounds so fucking intense and cool and thought-provoking like kindred holy shit sounds phenomenal then you've got parable of the sower and parable of the talents again like set in 2025 next year and it's about like a, an environmental disaster a woman kind of taking an odyssey across america i can't remember all the exacts but again it just feels very yeah like intense shit and Dawn, the first book in the Lilith's Brood series, or the Xenogenesis series, is no exception. Like, this is such a fascinating look at human nature. So the, the kind of plot line to this book is that Lilith wakes up on an alien ship. The Earth has been decimated by a nuclear fallout, so very much written in the Cold War era when paranoia about nuclear sort of warfare was at its highest. Yeah, so the Earth has been ruined, but an alien race has rescued people and now hold them captive, allegedly not in captive, but kind of most definitely captive, for their own good, to try and re-establish them back onto their planet that has been terraformed or like basically the toxic shit has been neutralized and these very kindly aliens are trying to send these humans back but there are conditions to this this alien race are fucking fascinating i keep swearing i'm sorry they're really really intriguing for the fact of what their culture is i don't want to give too many spoilers because it's interesting as it unravels and how Lilith slowly kind of she becomes less human and then other humans kind of look at her like she's alongside the aliens and so there's like distrust you can definitely look at it as a commentary on colonialization and from that angle it's utterly fascinating there's some Lord of the Flies shit that goes on I've never read the book but I know like kind of what it's about but it's just so intriguing and I love 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 like alien stuff <laughs> um, hence my coffee mug of the day is baby Yoda but it's just so fascinating to kind of think how we would interact with an alien race if it was just thrust upon us and I think Butler does such a phenomenal job with kind of how Lilith reacts to these aliens. She's completely horrified, disgusted, because they are so alien to what we would consider. Just, it's overwhelming. But slowly she assimilates into their culture as they give her the means to. And it's then this kind of feeling of betrayal of your own people but then also having an affinity with this alien race and kind of thinking I can use them to my benefit but I also... it's Stockholm Syndrome in a way. It's just... I'm in awe. Gorgeous cover. I asked my library to order this because I was like, yeah, very well me buying it myself but it wasn't in the library system and it was just like, holy shit, people need to read this including myself and already annoyingly I can't get the second or third book because someone else has booked them so like they've got them before they've even read the first one and obviously they're going to get the first one next but like hang on a minute that's a bit unfair like I've read the first book but now I'm going to have to wait for you to read probably all three of them so then I can read the second book 
human nature, man. Read this book, be less selfish. <laughs> love, love it. If you read a book that I recommend out of this whole video, you have to read this one. Because I think it's definitely, it's the best book I read in March. Stunning. Other books I've read, I'm going to quickly talk about the audiobooks that I've read and are currently reading before I forget about them. So, actually no, there's a, be a segue, forget what I just said. Then, oops. <laughs> then I read Magma by Thora Your Life's Daughter. So this is a book translated from Icelandic into English. I read this because I was making a display at my library about books from different countries. So currently we've got a display about Japanese literature. So like the idea is it's like a little travel agency within the library where you can basically travel by reading literature. And the next destination is Iceland because there is like a crime fiction festival coming up at my library. So I thought, ah, what country writes crime like nobody else? Iceland. Um, so that's like the next destination. But I did find a few intriguing books that aren't to do with crime. And I mean, this is a crime against humanity, but one man being an utter fucking asshole. <laughs> but yeah, so Magma is basically a story about a young woman who falls in love with literally the worst person in the world. He's disgusting, despicable, such a little narcissistic worm. And yeah, I, I read this in one sitting because it's very kind of fragmented, like almost lyrical. I think the author is a poet as well. I wasn't like massively impressed by this. I would just kind of got through it. And yeah, it's like harrowing. The experiences are probably quite accurate to real experiences of real women dealing with narcissistic men who kind of just grind them down and bully them, abuse them. There's a whole load of trigger warnings that we'd need to go with this book, but it's it's an eye opener. But yeah, so it was a, an interesting read, but n not anything kind of I would sing home about, like read it if you want. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Right, in terms of books I'm currently reading, I'll quickly run through them and then I'll let you know one book that I finished that then leads on to movies which I'm sure you know what it is. <laughs> uh, right, so I'm currently reading another book that I found on my Iceland display shelf. So like basically I've taken all the books that I want to read that I'm going to put on the display. So it's like, I've got to read these quickly. Uh, but this is Hi Haida or Haitha, A Shepherd at the End of the World. So this is like a non-fiction about a woman who is a shepherd in Iceland. It sounds so fucking random. But a couple of years ago, or was it last year, I decided that I was going to, like... Well, I had this whole idea where I was going to study in Iceland because I became obsessed with the Icelandic sagas. Um, <laughs> and this fizzled out. Um, I'm no longer, like, doing everything I can to kind of make that my reality. This happens all the time. Like, I set my heart on something, become obsessed with it for a while, and then suddenly I've got no interest. I decided I wanted to read this again, because at the time where I was thinking about this, I was thinking of writing a cheesy romance novel. <laughs> I'm publishing it probably like on something like on Kindle like you know those crap romance novels that everyone buys but they're shit um, and the, yeah so I was thinking of trying to write a really cliche rubbish romance novel for fun about a sheep farmer on Iceland and a woman who is a folklore expert so like, because I'm really interested in folklore and things like that, I thought it would be quite easy to write a character that is also that. Um, and they like travel to Iceland, get lost in a snowstorm, <laughs> and then a sheep herder saves them and then they fall in love. Who knows, maybe it will happen. But yeah, I felt like reading this because like, maybe I'll get some ideas. <laughs> and maybe I'll write it. Who knows, watch this space. Um, I'm also currently reading another non-fiction which is called Dwellings and it's by Linda Hogan. Um, she is a native writer and it's basically like a, a meditation, it's like collections of essays about nature 
and her spiritual connection to the land. She's part of the Chickasaw native tribe and so basically you're seeing her lens on the world which makes for some really interesting observations of nature and how humans can connect to it. So I've only read the first essay so far. There was a paragraph or the first couple of lines that kind of really drew me in and thought, wow, like this is gonna be a really interesting and cool read. So it's like, for years I prayed for an eagle feather. I wanted one from a bird still living. A killed eagle would offer me none of what I hoped for. A bird killed in the name of human power is in truth a loss of power from the world not in addition to it. Hello. And then it like kind of makes me think of all those horrid people that go to Africa and hunt lions and like stand by them with their guns and they're like, yeah, look at me, I've just killed an innocent lion kind of thing. And it's just like, dude, that's, that's not cool. That doesn't show power. That is literal, just an ick and kind of, yeah, it's a loss of power, really. You and your fancy gun shooting a beautiful, majestic creature that has every right to live and exist as much as you, and you just, yeah, for sport and for showing off, murdered it. So yeah, this is really interesting so far. I'm probably gonna just like dip into it over the rest of April. God, sorry about the lighting. Ah! Um, I'm also currently reading Leviathan Wakes by James S.A. Corey. This is the first book in the Expanse series. I've watched the show and I've had this book, like, I kind of bought it after I started watching the show and then I was just like, oh, might as well just watch the show. Why did I buy the book? But then I was like, oh, I'm in the mood for like something science fiction-y. Hang on a minute. Let's read the first book and see whether you prefer the book to the show experience and then maybe continue reading the series if you do or just be like, fuck this shit, I'm out, and then just watch the show. So yeah, so that's why I'm reading this. I'm probably gonna read it on audio as well to like dip in and out of the physical copy because it's massive and my attention span is shocking when it comes to massive books. But at the moment, I'm currently listening to Yellow Face by Rebecca Kwan on audiobook eye-opening and kind of like, holy shit. It's a satire and thriller about the publishing industry, about white authors, Asian American authors, and kind of the, the racism within the publishing industry. Kind of unbelievable in a way, but it definitely hits home with all the kind of microaggressions. The way the character is written, she's literally the most ludicrous person I've ever read because just it's baffling how this person operates and saying all these things and it's just like you're so narcissistic, it's unreal, it's making me feel ill listening to this narration, which I think is brilliant, like this story could have been told from a different perspective but having it from the perspective of an extremely unlikable, out of touch, fucking crazy woman, basically, is a very interesting experience. And hats off to Rebecca Kwan. I do actually need to read more of her work. Like I've been meaning to read the Poppy War series and also Bab Babel or Babel. I think I got that on Kindle for like 99 pence. So when I find my Kindle and charge it up, I'll probably give that a go as well. But yeah, so like it calls out a lot of bad, bad behaviour. And I, I like the kind of how it's written as well. Like it very much leans into a good audiobook experience. So I think I'm enjoying it more because it's almost like the character is talking to you. Soon I'm gonna read this gorgeous edition of Midsummer Night Dream. Like, holy shit, the new covers on some of these new Penguin editions of Shakespeare are literally insane, beautiful. And it's like kind of a riff on YA tropes. So it's like very much trying to get teenagers and young adults reading Shakespeare, which I'm sorry, everyone should read Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare. And I think these cool char characters, these cool covers kind of, it's a very clever marketing attempt. I've never read Midsummer's Night Dream. I saw this cover, I was like, yeah, let's read it. I mean, I've been meaning to read it because it's like fairies and shit, which is just everything I'm about. And it's a comedy and it's a bit frivolous 
and silly but then like I've already started reading it and there's like so much misogyny at the beginning it's unreal yeah to you your father should be as a god one that composed your beauty yea and one to whom you are but as a form in wax by him imprinted and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it eh what <laughs> fuck off but yeah, no, it's interesting. Then another couple of books I've got from my library that I'm going to be reading soon is Weasels in the Attic by Hiroko Oyamada. Look at that cover. How <laughs> how cute is that? I don't know what it's about, but there's weasels in the attic. And the cover's so cute. And then Seven Brief Lessons on Physics by Carlo Rovelli. I want to know more about science. So yeah, they're the books that I've been reading and am currently reading. And now let's just quickly talk about an audiobook that I've read that very much leans into the greatest film experience of this year so far. And that's none other than June. So I went to see June part two at the IMAX and wow, stunning, beautiful. I, I cried. <laughs> I cried at the end, Charlie man. Like that look of betrayal, Jesus Christ, that just got me, there were tears. Beautiful, so glad they're gonna make part three. And the reason why I reread Dune was actually so that I could continue with the series because I read it like four years ago now and I really wanted to get in, get to Messiah before it's made into a movie. I don't know when they're gonna make the movie but it was announced the other day that there will be a third film and yeah like I think this time around I enjoyed the book more than I did the first time around and that's because of listening to it on audiobook so like some of the little boring bits in the desert don't last as long because like I just struggled through that yeah like I really enjoyed it like the audio version is a bit dated as well like there's some weird sound effects in it and then sometimes some of the characters have all their own voices but it was fun and I guess strangely I have this thing I don't know whether people know about it but I think it's a legit thing and it's called like aph aphantasia where I basically can't imagine things in images like if I try to imagine and see things in my mind's eye I can't do it so like when reading books sometimes I feel like there's just a distance between me as the reader and the book and sometimes it just doesn't kind of gel with me. It's like if I've read a book that I've seen an adaptation of it feels more real because I can remember what it looks like in someone's vision. So like reading June again kind of is I'm getting the Denny Villeneuve version. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was cool. Don't you just love it when you like match with your drinking vessel? So yeah, June. Fade Ralther, brilliant. Loved the showdown between the two characters. There's obviously like some things that have been changed and, and missed out. Like Charney is a bit more vocal about her discomfort around Paul becoming more dib and sort of fulfilling this prophecy that he's gonna basically turn into a piece of shit. Um, and annihilate, like basically cause a genocide. Um, the way he falls into it is different than the book. Yeah, so events happen slightly out of order. Um, there's also like complete omissions, like the Baron is not a pervert, or explicitly. He doesn't have strange relationships with young men, which I think is the right decision because it does kind of detract from it and makes him quite cartoonish and obviously it feels like a bit uncomfortable with like the whole thing that like Disney did at one point where all the villains were gay or they were drag inspired so like making Baron like Baron Harkonnen less of a caricature of a villain I think definitely was the wiser choice what else? The only criticism I really have of the Villeneuve films is just the very muted colour palette. Like, I kind of see it as more like fiery colours. And like the way the description is, like there's a scene, I think it's at the, um, like the fight um, that Fade Ralpha does. And obviously in the film it was phenomenally shot in this infrared, which really cool because of like the sun but like in the book it's described that everyone's in very colourful clothing so then it just feels like it's very muted compared to perhaps what it could have been if it was more colourful and bombastic but I guess that's just not the vibe but yeah 
adored the movie. I thought it was fantastic. I came out kind of thinking, wow, like that's one of the best science fiction films I'm ever going to see at the cinema. And I just hope that they continue to adapt this complex and intriguing story in the right way. And then obviously like the influx of Lisanna Gaib memes was <laughs> kind of hilarious. Um, but yeah, everyone needs a hype man like Stilgar. Um, what other movies did I watch? I've watched some bizarre stuff um, and things that don't like kind of fit in with each other. Then I randomly watched one night John Wick Chapter 4 because I hadn't seen it and I saw it was on Amazon Prime. Really enjoyed it. I fucking love John Wick. Like it's so ridiculous, so unbelievable. But like you know you're gonna have a good time. Keanu Reeves just beating the shit out of people, killing them left, right and centre. It's going to be a good time. And there's like one kind of set piece or scene in this. No, there was quite a few actually. Like the opening and the beginning in Japan was really cool. And I love Rina Sawayama as an artist. So then she was in this. It's like... That's cool. Yeah, so that set piece was really cool, like very kind of neon gorgeousness. And then the ending of the film in Paris, like where he basically has to get to a, a particular place, so the Sacre Coeur, and like everyone is basically out on a bounty hunt against him and he just has to fight his way through Paris. And there's a bit at the Arc de Triomphe, which I've been to the Arc de Triomphe, and looking at the roundabout around it, it's just utter chaos. And so then putting a fight scene there literally is genius and kind of hilarious. But yeah, really good movie. I love John Wick films. I think they're so just so action. And sometimes you just want a mindless, fun action film that looks really cool. And Keanu Reeves is hot. <laughs> what more could you want? So I then watched a shit Icelandic film. It's in English and it's got a lot of English actors in it, but it was also written and directed by an Icelandic person. It was crap. Northern Comfort on Netflix. I thought it was going to be like a kind of feel good story about. So it's basically about people that have a fear of flying and they go on a fear of flying course and end up in Iceland and get stranded. And I thought it was going to be like a feel good thing where everyone kind of like overcomes their fears. It's just a fucking fever dream <laughs> and ridiculous. It wasn't particularly good at all. Then I watched Godland because I kind of was like, oh, I need more Iceland. Um, this is by Hilnur Palmason who did A White White Day, which I watched last year or the year before and did a review of it. Find it somewhere up there. This one, phenomenal, gorgeous. The cinematography is literally art, but it's excruciatingly boring in parts. I had to watch it over a couple of days because I was just like, I, I can't do this. I can't do it. Um, but yeah, so like the concept of the story is that it's about this priest who comes from Denmark on a missionary mission to build a church in Iceland. And he also has this project where he wants to be the first person to photograph the inhabitants of the island. And so he carries like this massive pack with all his camera equipment and he goes on this kind of pilgrimage through the Icelandic landscape to this village and he captures people on his camera on the way and the beautiful landscapes and everything. And the way it's shot, you're gonna, you're gonna have it in that little four to three ratio. Of course you are. And just the way the edging of it, it feels very much like you're looking through the viewfinder of the camera. Genius. Stunning. And pretty much, Every frame in this film could be a stunning photograph. And so I loved how the medium kind of reflects the story that's been told. Clever stuff. I oh, just, it's such a magical, beautiful looking place. And I'm obsessed again. I really need to go to Iceland just to bask, just to bask in the gorgeousness, the majesty, and the kind of terror of the landscape. Like it's very much what you get like in the Gothic stories where it's like awe inspiring because it's just so overwhelmingly dangerous and beautiful. But yeah, back to the movie. Oh, so son, you are killing me today. What was I saying? Yeah, so it's kind of boring, but beautiful. And it kind of very much tells a traditional, almost saga-like story as well. So like the priest, 
basically is just worn down by this journey and just something bubbles in him there's also a resentment to his guide who refuses to kind of speak in danish even though he knows it yeah so there's like a lot of tension between these two people and it all comes to a head and there's just like murder revenge it's very visceral as well towards the end of the movie um but yeah it's, it's really kind of a beautiful story but it, and you have to have patience with it so clearly i just probably stuck it on when i was in the wrong mood for a very meandering slow story that then picks up at the end but yeah i definitely recommend it if you love very cinematic slow films that kind of are rooted in a very literary artsy vibe and kind of study it's a character study yeah of this kind of priest that then becomes kind of fucking mentally unstable and not a very good messenger of god but yeah gorgeous gorgeous movie and then the final film i watched which technically was on the first of april but i'll be damned if i remember it by the end um but it was flux gourmet by peter strickland what the hell so bizarre so weird and again like i think i've mentioned or spoken about a few strickland films on this channel i've been meaning to watch this for ages and i'd just watched godland and then I saw that it was leaving soon. So this was on B BFI player. So it was like, I've got to watch it immediately before it goes. I think it was literally leaving the, like, the platform the next day. And I was like, well, I don't know when I'm going to get to watch this. And I've been meaning to watch it for ages. But kind of put it off because I knew it was going to be weird. Um, but yeah, like, it's about culinary artists. So it's like, very much feels like a satire and critique on me the music industry theatre and all that kind of thing but kind of making it a weird bizarre thing where people make music and art out of culinary stuff it's strange watch the trailer and you'll kind of get an idea of where it's going with it and it's just batshit crazy i don't even know how to describe it but again it very much feeds into strickland's obsession with weirdness and auditory experiences like underground blah blah, blah studio thing what are uh, the bubble something studio i've forgotten the film that one very much feeds into the auditory experience there's like elements of in fabric in it as well like the very strange retail experiences in this kind of feed into the weird critique of retail in in fabric um but yeah it's just weird if you're a freak and you like freaky movies watch this I must admit there was a moment in it that I actually did get disgusted by and that doesn't happen very often anymore. If you watch it I think you'll know what the part is that I found quite vile. <laughs> um, but yeah like it was it was an interesting watch. I don't think it's his strongest movie by any means um, and I haven't seen all of his movies. I think I'm missing his earliest movie but I really did enjoy the butterfly one. I've forgotten what it's called. The Duke of Burgundy. Stunning. I also really did enjoy, uh, right, the yeah, Barbarian Sound Studio, fantastic, and In Fabric. I really enjoyed those three. This one kind of felt not up to the level, but still very weird. And Gwendolyn Christie in it is fabulous. Love her. Um, but yeah, strange, strange, strange. That's all I can say. Fucking weird, but kind of amazing. Right, and then let's quickly do television because I'm I've been rambling for so long. So I have been watching three shows really in March um, while also still feeding my Baldur's Gate 3 obsession. It's insane. I don't know how I'm managing to do all of this stuff while having a full time job. I think I did have like a week and I had quite a bit of holiday in March actually. That's why I've been able to do this. Um, yeah, so I watched The Three Body Problem. I've read the first two books. I think there was some spoilers for season, uh, for book three in there, which I'm not happy about. But I thought overall it was a pretty decent adaptation of a very tricky novel to adapt. And yeah, so I enjoyed it. There's been criticisms of it. I can understand why. It's very much a very Western adaptation. So a lot of the characters have been switched for either white characters, Hispanic characters and black characters from the original Chinese but there's still quite a few Chinese characters in it and 
I was happy that the historical parts they actually kept they kept it in Mandarin which I thought was really important but yeah I, I think at some point if I can get access to it I'm gonna watch the Ten Cent version because that I believe only covers the first book and obviously it is very much geared towards a Chinese audience so it keeps everything in Chinese so and then I'll like to do like a comparison and then at some point I'm gonna finish the series but Death's End is so intimidating in its size that's why I've put it off like I really enjoyed the first two books and then every time I see Death's End on my shelf I'm like oh I really need to read you but I just can't quite make myself do it but yeah let me know what you thought of Three Body Problem adaptation I'm kind of intrigued what people think of it I'm kind of I don't know I don't know whether I'm in the minority but I'm very unprecious about adaptations of things I really enjoy except from The Rings of Power which I thought was atrocious <laughs> in quite a lot of places some things I enjoyed some things I hated but on the whole I'm quite loose with how I feel about adaptations and I don't mind if things get changed as long as it kind of makes the story better or it adds something to the story then I have been watching I'm still watching Shogun I think I'm like on episode five or six. I haven't read the book that it's based on, but I'm really, really enjoying the show. It looks gorgeous. The cinematography is like very, very beautiful. And it's just a very intriguing story. Like I'm not too familiar with Edo period Japan. So it's very interesting. I will probably talk about it more at the end when I've finished it because I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> and then another TV show that I watched was a Swedish crime drama, Top Dog season two. So I think I spoke about season one last year where it, when it aired. I really enjoy this show. It's really interesting. Like it kind of shows the dark underbelly of Stockholm and um, a sort of deprived area that kind of is riddled with crime. But there's like this guy who's one of, one of the main characters, he's like kind of trying to distance himself from his sort of upbringing and integration in the criminal underworld but it's like it's hard to let go of these ties and there's like family, obligations and yeah so it's, it's very interesting and um, there's also like this lawyer in it who kind of gets caught up in this mess as well yeah like their relationship is really interesting as well like the two characters I've forgotten their names <laughs> but yeah it's really good it's on Walter Presents in the UK which is on channel 4 so if you really like world drama then you probably already know about it but yeah so I literally went on there to check whether there were any new shows that I wanted to watch and then I saw Top Dog season two I was like oh my fucking god watch it because I've been waiting for them to bring it out in this country so yeah like it was very fortuitous that I literally went on the platform on the day that it came out so what um but yeah I think that's the end of the video thank you for watching um let me know what you've been reading and watching in the month of March have you read or watched any of the things I've been talking about if so let's chat about it in the comments yeah thank you I don't really know what else to say I always struggle with ending videos because it feels just very like yeah I'm done laters <laughs> um yeah so I'm done laters <laughs>